my name is Abigail Lanier, as Ms. Cole mentioned, and I'm 22 years old. I graduated from Appalachian State University in the western part of North Carolina in May of 2014. And I'm currently working with the nonprofit here in New York called the Media. We provide opportunities and resources to artists and musicians with blindness. Um, and I'm a freelance audio engineer. And do you work out of your home? Yeah, I work out of um, Virginia's office as well as my own. Okay. All right. Juan Carlos. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Juan Carlos Reyes. I'm a Bronx native. Um, I am a graduate of Harry School in Harlem, um, undergraduate Baruch College and City University of New York, um, MA Teachers College, Columbia University. I'm currently working at the Institute for Student Achievement, which is now a division of ETS, um, and that's about it for now. I'm William Grace, I go to the College of Mount St. Vincent, it's my first year there. I'm 18 and... Uh, <laughs> Hi, I'm Molly Roberts, I'm 16 years old and I'm a junior at the Horace Mann School. I'm Helena Lubin, um, I'm in sixth grade and I'm 11 years old. First of all, I want to give them all a round of applause. Because I think you're all terrific, I really do. So, what is the most difficult situation you've ever had to go through? We can start with you, Abigail. Um, one of the most difficult obstacles that I've had to overcome was um, being diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in July of 2013. Um, and you know, being di diagnosed with cancer is never something that um, anyone anticipates or expects. But for me, I think in a very, um, in a surprising way, my disability helped me overcome battling cancer um, and being able to move on because I, at that, up until that point in my life, I'd already overcome other obstacles that, that come along um, with having a disability. But um, the type of endurance and ambition that I had already cultivated um, helped me to be able to go through treatment and I'm happy to say that I'm now on remission. Juan Carlos. Oh, um, picking, it's, it's kind of hard to just pick one um, specific scenario, but I would say um, the transition from being a not so focused student in my very earlier um, high school years to um, doing a complete turnaround and um, and you know really um, that was made possible um, by a community um, it was made possible by a group of teachers and principals and mentors that believed in my ability to um, not only graduate from high school but pursue um, a, a, you know, <coughs> higher education and a career. Um, so, you know, overcoming the many ob obstacles that comes with growing up in the Bronx and, um, you know, falling into the rough crowds was difficult. Um, and it was made possible because of a community of teachers that believed in me. Um, and what that turned into is that now I'm in a career in education myself. Um, and I do it because I feel that, um, it's my responsibility to pay for my good fortune. Um, the organization that I work with, um, the Institute for Student Achievement, um, it's an organization that's founded on seven research-based principles. And it's basically the idea that every student deserves the opportunity to go to college. But not only does every student deserve that opportunity, but we have a responsibility to prepare every student and to believe and to show them that we believe that they can make it. Um, I'm a product of a small school. I'm a product of um, good mentors. And that's why I choose to do um, what I do today. Thank you, Juan. William. Um, for me, the most difficult thing I've ever done was really when I was um, diagnosed with having dyslexia. I was um, in school, and uh, I was diagnosed with dyslexia, but I didn't know it at the time. And every single day when all the kids would go to English class, I would have to go and have a special tutor. This went on for a year. I didn't know 
what was wrong with me. I thought that I was stupid. I thought that something was just off. However, after that year, I went into Windward. Going to Windward really changed my life. It showed me that, yes, I might have a learning disability, but it doesn't mean that I'm stupid. It doesn't mean that I'm, that I'm wrong with me. That's something that I mean. <clears throat> It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with me. It means that I just take more time to read. And w in my time there, I saw that, yes, I might take more time to read, but I excel in other things, like in math and in science. So even though it was a tough point in my life, I really, going to Windward did bring it around, brought that whole tough part of my life around and showed that I can really succeed in life. Right. Um, the hardest part for me was being diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was 11. So um, when I was in sixth grade, I, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I, had, I was tired, I had weight loss, um, I had stomach pain, and I had to go through a series of tests. And um, I, they figured out that I had Crohn's disease. And it, um, so I had to figure out the hard part was I had to figure out what medicine, you know, would work for me. And it took a while to become, you know, perfectly healthy and feel like nothing was wrong. And um, I was feeling great until uh, last year I had to go through um, emergency surgery. Um, I had a narrowing in my intestine. And um, I'm really happy to say that I am also in remission. Um, I, after going through that whole thing, I was in the hospital for a week on IV fluids and um, getting that surgery was the best possible thing for me um, because now I feel great. So. <laughs> the hardest thing for me was probably when I was first diagnosed with diabetes because um, I didn't know what it meant or like what I had to do with it. I didn't know how much it would affect my life and what I had to do. Like, I used to have to take insulin injections like, like almost 60 times a week. Now I just have an insulin pump every um, other day I change it, so it's so much easier now. So the pump now takes over. The pump yeah. does everything you need it to do. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's interesting because some of these young people who we applaud you. We applaud you for your courage, your strength, your bravery. Um, but some of you have had physical illnesses, medical illnesses. Others have had um, intellectual or psychological illnesses. Not, not illnesses, but difficulties. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you, where you found the resources within, and how you tackled? the problems that you had. And after that, I'm going to let you have dessert. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's start at the other end. I mean, if you, if you want, no, OK. <laughs> Abigail. <laughs> Abigail, we'll start with you. Um, well, I was really fortunate to grow up in, in a home where my mom had a background in deaf education. So although when I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed with a visual impairment, which is completely different from um, the types of, um, you know, the circumstances that someone with a hearing loss might have, I, I had that support from my mom that she already was an advocate for um, people with disabilities. I honestly don't really remember, uh, remember realizing that I had a disability or that I was different from my peers until I was about eight. Um, and. I'm just grateful that my, my parents had the same expectations of me that they did of my able-bodied siblings. Um, I was still expected to do chores, to get good grades, and I think um, that that's something that is, um, I can see here today is just the support of teachers and people that are in science that everyone um, wants for children and, and adults with disabilities to live the same fulfilling lives that uh, able-bodied people do. Um, so I think, to answer your question, <laughs> the um, largest resource that I found to, to tackle the inconveniences of being blind came, from, uh, came directly from my mom. So a parent figure 
can be very, very important. And Abigail, what made you move from down south where you had done your education, you had friends, family, to come here? And she lives in Brooklyn, by the way, if there are any Brooklynites here. So what made you do that? Because that's a big move. It is a big move. Um, I studied audio engineering and production in school, and um, New York uh, is, you know, the place to be for almost everything, and they say if you can make it in New York, you can make it in New York. Right. So, Tony Bennett, um, I think, said that. And uh, honestly, I'm just a very ambitious person, so if someone told me, well, there's no way you could make it in New York, I'm going to prove them wrong. <laughs> That's true. Juan Carlos, you um. have been through a really, and people don't even realize this, if you are coming from an environment like Juan came from, you don't want to learn, you don't want to study, you don't want to achieve, you really are, you know, down in the dumps, and uh, it's, um, y y there's no motivation, and you're thrust into the land of drugs and um, violence. That's, I believe, I'm um, describing the world that you were in, Juan. Is that correct? Yeah, um, somewhat. Um, I think um, in terms of the environment, um, the South Bronx, um, you know, it, it was a very rough neighborhood um, where I grew up. Um, but there's no other place that I would call home, call home other than, than the Bronx. Um, I think um, to get to, to your question of resources, um, Again, I hinted to it a little bit earlier, but it's, you know, that old cliche saying of it's a village. Um, and when I, um, so let, let me take a step back. So before I entered high school, I, ha I had a really, I was very passionate about, uh, about learning. Um, my, my teachers in my middle schools were great. Um, somehow in the transition from middle school to high school, that sort of evaporated. It, it disappeared, that, that passion. I went to um, big school, um, Martin Luther King High School, um, first semester freshman year. And then I went to Roosevelt High School in the Bronx, second semester freshman year. And to describe the environment, these were big schools. Um, so if you had to get to a zero period class, um, which they had zero period, um, you had to get there at least half an hour earlier because the line to get into the school wraps around the block. And now to go inside the school, you have to walk through a metal detector, right? And if you just so happen to forget a piece of gum in your pocket, God forbid, that metal detector goes off. So you need to step off and get rescanned. And then when you walk through the rescanner, um, you're bumping into fights in the hallways, um, segregation by ethnic groups within the schools, um, a floor that floors that were controlled by different gangs. Right? So it became very easy for me to figure out a really smart routine back then, which was attendance is taken third period, which meant that if you, didn't, if you showed up for third period, then you wouldn't receive a phone call home, right? That automatic, your child didn't make it to school. So I figured out how to rig the system, right? So <laughs> I showed up, third period, English class, the only class that I actually got credit for that year. Um, and at the end of third period, right in front of the security guards, I would walk out with my friends and we would, we would go to somebody's house or party or we would go to a park and play basketball. We would go to a toy store, to an arcade, anywhere else that was in school because sitting in a class with 40 kids and, you know, actually making it a class and dealing with the nonsense in between just wasn't appealing to me. Is that still true today? Excuse me for interrupting. That, um, that kids have to go through the metal detectors if the lines wind around the blocks. Yeah, I Is think, that still true? Yeah, um, so it, it depends. Um, many schools in New York, as, as we all know, have been broken down. So Roosevelt and all of these school, big schools, Kennedy High School, have been broken down. Um, ISA actually has schools um, within these buildings. Um, I think it's regulated a little more, but I, I, there's still metal detectors in many schools. You know, and there's an argument for why we should keep them, um, but uh, the, you know, it wasn't just the metal detectors. I think it was the mentality of, um, of the security guards that um, are in the building. Um, you know, we, I think we need to 
pay attention to how we train um, the adults that interact with students um, so that they're not, you know, we train the teachers, um, the principals are obviously trained, but not all the staff in the buildings are trained to deal with students and with the social emotional issues that come with being raised in um, marginalized neighborhoods. So did you drop out? Because when did, I want to get to where yeah, when you so, got to the Heritage School and Joyce Cowan's yeah. role in this. So what happened was um, I, and for my sophomore year, I decided, all right, I need to make this, this turnaround. And Peter Dillon, who was then the, um, the, the AP at Heritage at the time, um, well, I, actually, just a quick step back, and I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'm, uh, I'm going to make it quick. Um, Arthur, I, I knew Arthur Levine um, from Teachers College um, because he was writing a book about my neighborhood. And Arthur said, you know, you should speak to Peter Dillon at Heritage because you might, um, uh, you, you might find another path, path that way. And when I spoke to Peter Dillon at, at Her Heritage for the interview to get into the school, Peter said, um, you, know, some, you know, kid, sometimes people need a first chance. Sometimes they need a second, third, fourth, or fifth chance. Um, and that's all I needed um, to make that turnaround. Um, and like um, Dr. Rosen said, the Heritage School was um, a school that was founded by TC faculty. Um, and Joyce Cowan was a, um, one trustee. of the donors. She's uh, a trustee. She's a TC yeah. trustee and a, and a donor of um, the Heritage School. And yeah, those, in terms of resources, it was the community that I found at Heritage. It was not walking through the metal detectors and walking to, into a caring and nurturing school building instead of a um, scary building. <laughs> well, I want to tell you that Peter Dillon and Joyce Cowan and Arthur Levine are so proud of you. Uh, Arthur Levine was the president of Teachers College. He's now the head of the Woodrow Wilson Foundation in New Jersey. Uh, Joyce is still the trustee of Teachers College and takes a very deep and abiding interest in education wherever it is. And uh, Peter Dillon is now a superintendent of schools up in the Berkshires. And I'm in touch with all of them. So I bring you greetings. And Juan, applause to you for your voyage. Will, how did you face it and how did you do it? Really perseverance. Um, I remember when I was younger, uh, when me and my friends would get into play fights, I would always get back, back up. If I fall down, I would get back up. In my life, I've had to overcome a small speech impediment. I got through that by just persevering and kept on moving forward. Same with my small motor function impairment. When it comes to my dyslexia, I, when I was younger, I didn't want to read. However, as I gotten older, I, want, I read more, I read fan fiction, I read books, I just read anything that I liked. And now that when I look at my dyslexia, I see that I'm not, it's not as hard as I, not as hard to read as when, when I was a kid. So it's just perseverance for me that has really made a difference in different parts of my life. Great. That's a great message to give to the rest of us. Okay, Molly. Um, for me, um, I think um, I, what I did to overcome my challenge of Crohn's disease was I took all my energy and I put that into, you know, helping others. And I realized that it was more important to, you know, help others who, are, who have gone through the same thing that I have gone through, who are still going through it. And I decided that um, instead of just sitting there feeling sorry for myself, that I would try to help other people. Um, so what I did was I created um, a jewelry company, um, Jewelry by Molly Roberts, and I started that three years ago. Um, and um, I donate all the proceeds to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and to my research fund at Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, I also love to sing and play guitar, and it's just always, I'm always playing and singing and performing. It's what I love to do, and throughout all of this, I, you know, I, I always kept performing and singing, and I, I eventually got to put up um, songs on iTunes, and I donate all the profits from um, my song Champion um, that I wrote about Crohn's disease to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, um, so that's really how I've... Um, overcome obstacles. Molly, if you send me a link. If you send me a link to the jewelry and the iTunes, 
I will share it with everyone in this room. <laughs> okay. And so we can all either just listen or buy. <laughs> but we'll make a contribution in some way. I think that's terrific, really. And last but not least. Um, what we do, like my family, there's a walk every year for JDRF. It's um, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. There's a walk this year, it's on May 3rd. And there are teams, my team is called Sweet for Cure, so you can donate if you like. There should be a link at the bottom of the biography, of my biography. And you walk and raise money for the awareness of JDRF. And also, I bake cookies and desserts, like in the bento boxes there were French macaroons. Like, I make French macaroons and other cookies, and I made a cake, and I bake for the awareness of that sounds delicious. But we did put into your bio, as you had requested, the link to the walk. So if anybody wants to do something for diabetes, they can do that. That would be terrific, really. So I want to just say that you are wonderful. I think you're great. And you've all overcome such difficulties in your lives. And that gives inspiration to the rest of us in the room. I want to give them a hand, really. Thank you.